All right. Welcome back, everybody, to the Synthesis Workshop podcast today. Today, I'm very excited to be joined by Professor John Hartwig, who's at UCLA Berkeley. And uh, wait, UC, no, UC Berkeley. Uh, I said UCLA. <laughs> oh, <that's the> <laughs> yeah, right. I was going to say that's a big rivalry right there. Uh, no, but um, uh, yeah, UC Berkeley. Um, you know, very excited to have him on today. We're discussing a lot about, you know, your chemistry today, but also a little bit of insight into to your background. Because I, I know some people um, would love to hear, love to hear us about some of the insights, let's say, into, you know, your chemistry and, uh, but also just your background in general. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I was doing a little bit of, uh, you know, a little bit of background work and, you know, you, you were born in Chicago, but raised in New York. So I'm kind of curious, you know, were you kind of, you know, raised in the sticks of New York? Or were you kind of closer to the, you know, maybe New York City or um, even Buffalo or anything like that? Yeah, I grew up. Um, yeah, I was born in, outside Chicago. My father was a graduate student at the time at Northwestern. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. And so then we moved. He got a, a job at Union College in Schenectady, New York, as a professor of political science. And um, so that's where I grew up. And that is, uh, I don't know, like 40 minutes away from Albany. Um, I grew up in a sub- sub- suburb of Schenectady called Niskayuna. Um, Niskayuna. So Union Hall was nearby, but also in Niskayuna was the General Electric Research and Development um, hmm. there hmm. Or, or facility there. So there were actually quite a lot of kids whose parents worked there in some capacity. Um, and, you know, the school district that I was in definitely emphasized science and math in part because sure. I think of the influence of the GER and D facility that was nearby. Yeah, I think uh, a lot of people, unbeknownst to a lot of people, New York is much more than beyond, uh, you know, Buffalo, uh, Buffalo, New York City, obviously. But um, <laughs> there's actually a lot of great wilderness there in uh, New York. It can get quite cold. Um, yeah, so like yeah. You, like you just mentioned, though, if you are near, uh, if you're Winter, near, cold water. yeah, right. Uh, I don't know if you watched the, the Buffalo Bills recently, but they had people shoveling out the stadium just to get the game going in. They ended up losing anyway, which is quite unfortunate, but. Um, as about as Buffalo as it gets, I think, <laughs> I think, uh, shoveling and then ultimately losing a football game. Um, <laughs> but, um, no, I, I only kid, but yeah. So like you mentioned though, so, you know, kind of growing up near that general electric. So a lot of STEM, I, I suppose that now kind of coming up though, did you, you know, I mean, well, like you mentioned though, I guess your, your father was also a professor. So kind of academia, it's kind of always around, um, for you and, uh, but kind of coming up, you know, did you have any hobbies outside of say STEM or anything in particular, um, and just in general? Yeah, sure. Um, I played a lot of sports actually, and I Mm. played, uh, uh, my mother was a music major and she taught music in public schools. And, um, so I played trumpet from, and my grandfather played the trumpet. So I started, I don't know, second grade or something like that. And you still play the trumpet? (laughs) Uh, I played up through college. I played in the the jazz band. Oh, wow. in the orchestra college. Um, but I also played a lot of sports. I played, you know, like many kids, I played little league baseball and then Babe Ruth and I played high school baseball and mm. basketball all the way through. And um, I played one year of football that didn't suit me so well. So I played uh, goalie on the soccer team hey. um, the rest of the time in, in high school. But I, I generally played, uh, you know, three sports all year round. Yeah. yeah, quite active and yeah. quite active, keeping mm-hmm. academic, but also the the three season athletes. I I used to do that in, in high school. It's quite a really unique experience. I mean, playing three sports throughout high school while also doing like I'd actually, I actually I never played music. Um, I'm quite musically declined, honestly. I guess you could say I'm not really <laughs> musically literate, but um, uh, but playing three sports throughout high school and you know being academically. Um, I'd say involved too is it's quite a unique experience, I think. Um, but that's really that's really interesting yeah, was, that the unusual group of kids in that high school that I played sports with. Um mm. we were pretty bad in sports actually. I mean <laughs> that year, um, you know, we 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 <laughs> lost many games many more games than we won. <laughs> but the kids that played that year in my class, I mean, you know, one is like head of all of whatever and for Morgan Stanley, you know, right. international. <laughs> one is a laser uh, surgeon uh, for optometry mm. another as a phd in education and i mean there it's it was really quite a uh, academically inclined group of kids to spend time with so yeah um 
yeah, so it actually was, uh, it was a lot of fun because then they were all, you know, good friends and, you know, still keep up with them. And, wow. Um, yeah, it's quite a unique experience you know, then. Because of that special group. I mean, that's yeah. not true for the class above or below me wasn't necessarily that so much sure. that way, but, but that group was like you know, a whole bunch of like national merit scholar winners. Right. But, that's quite know, unique we were, then. Like, yeah, we were like four and twelve in basketball, and you know, three and, <laughs> yeah. three and in the soccer field. But you know, we had fun, and we kept. Uh, yeah, sure. You got to it's it's a uh, got to stay active there. And then uh, somehow, I, especially in, like the winter sports, when like during like December, January, and then you like your games are like like or you got to get on the you spend all day in school, and then you got to go right to the game, and then you come home at like five and it's dark out it's like the weirdest feeling ever i don't know if anyone's like that feeling is super weird um mm -hmm. it's kind of unique I, I would say to the northeast because i i swear the the nights are longer than the northeast but I, it could be long <laughs> it gets dark earlier in the northeast right. the yeah yeah <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah um but in Actually, any case you know, that's, yeah go for it. that because when i came to berkeley for graduate school now mm. that you mentioned that it was when it the first year i was here and it got dark early, like the time changed. And I walked out of the, you know, out of lab and it was dark, but warm. Mm. And <laughs> a very strange feeling to have it four, <laughs> dark at four o'clock and warm. Cause I'm used to being dark at four o'clock and you're with this park yeah. and the wind is, yeah, yeah. Right, exactly. right. Yeah, no, yeah. so. I, what... Much of the world, it's that way, but for not for the Northeast, those of us yeah. in the Northeast. That Northeast, the Northeast weather hits it, different. Um, particularly that the New York, the New York, um, wind is a uh, pretty brutal. Um, but this is actually a good transition though. Cause, uh, I, you know, like you mentioned, you had done your, um, graduate school at UC, uh, Berkeley as well, but kind of right, I guess right before into that, you know, kind of coming up, I mean, was chemistry something that you'd always in, had been interested in and, you know, was going to graduate school kind of an easy, easy decision. Like how did that kind of all transpire for yourself? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like I was saying earlier, I, I did come from a family that was, you know, very academic or mm. involved in education, right? So um, I mentioned my father was a, a professor at a small college, but, you know, my mother taught music, as I said, my sister teaches public school, my my aunt taught art in public school, my grandparents taught public school, like everybody this was is, in public school. This is really <laughs> ingrained in academia, man. <laughs> yeah, so I kind of didn't. It's not that I didn't have a choice. I didn't know of anything else, but it was also sure. just uh, um, a sense that that, you know, a, a career in education was a really valuable one and had, a, you know, had an impact on other people that was positive. Um, so, um, yeah, so a choice to go to graduate school was not a really a complicated choice. Mm -hmm. um, but what about like going all the way to Berkeley, though? So, you know, you, you know, kind of grew up in New York. I'm kind of curious to see how, you know. How'd you stumble across Berkeley? I'm, you know, I'm not sure how big of a name it was. Let's say in academia. But, um, yeah, in yeah. I mean, I applied to some schools in California, and I applied um, to Wisconsin, I think, and applied to schools in the Northeast. Um, and you know, when I visited places, I had actually I had never been west of the Mississippi. I think. <laughs> <That's good. laughs> well, I went to visit Stanford and Berkeley to to look at graduate schools. Um, but it was really exciting and I, I was, it seemed like a great place to be. And so, you know, I, I partly chose to go there because it would be in California and a yeah. different place to live, but also because, you know, it's a, a school with, of course, many incredible people to work for and choices of, of science to do. So that combination yeah. is what, yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Cause you're, you're a graduate advisor, uh, or at least I guess, I guess co-advisory would be, you know, professors Bob Bergman and Richard Anderson. And so, you know, how mm -hmm. did you end up in, in working with, uh, those, uh, well, distinguished professors, really, how did you um, um, choose them as their yeah. advisors? Yeah, it was uh, not by design, really. It was kind of a spontaneous um, to to work with the two of them in a project. Um, so I guess, you know, I was very interested in reaction mechanisms. And um, I guess you would ask why, I, you know, how long did I, um, you know, have been interested in chemistry? So I actually went to college um, as an engineering major, an electrical mm. engineering major. Um, and I didn't take AP chemistry in high school. So wow. I, it's a cardinal sin. <laughs> <laughs> so I, had, I took AP biology. Um, and, uh, so I was required to take chemistry to for my electrical engineering major. 
and I just really loved the chemistry class that was taught. It was taught by Maitland Jones um, mm. at the time, and it was all about molecular orbital theory and explaining, you know, everything in terms of molecular orbitals. And so that was, uh, you know, really a fantastic class. Everybody loved that class. Um, like people would take my roommates took that class just for fun, you know. Uh, so <laughs> <laughs> it's just a true story. So. Uh, so I continued with the chemistry and then in my second year, um, I hadn't changed my major or anything, but I, so I took the elect electrical engineering curriculum, but also took organic chemistry to decide what to do. Mm. And, uh, and that's why I decided that I would do chemistry instead of yeah. electrical engineering. Actually, I really liked the three dimensionality of molecules and like Walden inversion, you know, to, to, to show how an SN2 reaction occurred, things like that about to explain a reaction mechanism. So I continued right. to research on, on reaction mechanisms in my undergrad research with Nate Jones, actually, also. Yeah. Um, I should have. I went to grad, uh, I I went gonna, graduate school. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, uh, <laughs> sorry, sorry. I was just going to say, I, I should mention that, yeah, you, you did go to uh, Princeton University as your undergrad. I should have should mentioned that beforehand. Um, but yeah. yeah, go ahead. Sorry about that. Yeah. So when I went to graduate school, I was also very interested in working with people on, uh, you know, understanding reaction mechanisms and, hmm. uh, I guess, you know, after looking at a variety of groups, um, ultimately decided to work with Bob Bergman in part, be, you know, he's very interested in reaction mechanisms, of course. And, um, but it seemed like there was so much to be learned about the reactions of transition metal complexes. Mm. Um, so that's why I chose to work with him. But then, um, you know, we were selecting projects and just by kind of, uh, spontaneously, um, interested in, you know, well, uh, take a step back, you know, so at that time um, was when a little bit after Bob Bergman had discovered the oxidative addition of alkyl CH bonds, this landmark mm. reaction discovery he had. And so we were interested in looking at other metals and other ligands to see what the scope of that would be. And one of the um, systems we were thinking of studying was a ruthenium phosphine based system mm. that would be electronic with the ones that were the iridium ones that he worked with. So Dick Anderson had done some work with those types of complexes. So, you know, it's a Berkeley is a friendly place. Colleagues are, you know, very collaborative here for decades. And so, um, you know, Bob called up Dick and said, Hey, you want to come down and, uh, and talk to us about this? I know you worked on this. So oh, wow. Dick came down. And then the next thing you knew, I was doing a joint PhD with uh, Bob Bergman and Dick Anderson. And that's awesome. I was the first of a whole series of people who did that because it was, um, such a complementary education. You know, there are mm -hmm. very different types of people with different knowledge bases, but, um, the, you know, that, that line of research led to a whole series of papers. Yeah, that's quite a, that's quite, it's, it's really interesting, um, to hear because, yeah, I mean, I, I've talked to other professors, um, who've done either postdocs or also graduate students of like, you know, Bob Bergen and, and, uh, Dick Anderson and like, my impression is that, you know, I've never, I never met them, but my impression is that, you know, they're, these, these are like some of the. I I don't know, maybe founding fathers, but like of organometallics, like just, I mean, strictly understanding, let's say like what is happening at the metal center is quite, um, it, to me, it's really fascinating. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I don't know if you have like, maybe like, I was going to say that the two of them, you know, their expertise really was a compliment. Um, you know, Bob was someone who of course was very adept at studying the mechanisms of reactions. Um, had a good sense for, you know, what to learn about in, in the full field overall. Um, Dick also had a sense of that, but he was much more about the synthesis of complexes. I mean, of course, at that time mm. I worked for him, he was much more into the F elements than transition metals, but mm. um, still had worked with Wilkinson and did, you know, work at Berkeley early on with transition metal complexes. And mm. so he had, you know, I don't know, variable temperature, NMR and the properties of compounds and, you know, what we call now electronic structure of compounds was something that he was very interested and adept in. And so we could learn a lot more of the, you know, properties of the transition metals from Dick and a lot more of the reactivity and the mechanism um, mm -hmm. from Bob. So that was a really, you know, we have a full spectrum of expertise and interest. And so whatever we, you know, wanted to, to know about or to what direction we want to take the project was okay with someone. Yeah. What, what I'm curious to know is how, how did he pitch the project to you? Cause I, you know, like coming out of like, from my personal experience coming out of undergrad and then going to graduate school, you know, you know, trying to explain to an undergrad organometallic chemistry is is a quite a difficult subject. Like it's not it's not easily grasped. So what I'm curious about is like when you first joined this group and he's pitching projects to you, like how did that like 
how did he pitch it? Like what, what kind of stuck out about it? And, you know, where did that, you know, how did this, mm-hmm. how'd that go? Well, there's a couple things about that. First, I took a graduate level course in organometallic chemistry from Jeff mm-hmm. Schwartz when I was okay. undergrad at Princeton. So I had a pretty good background and I had um, in that class learned about, you know, Bob's work on CH activation and Crabtree's work on CH activation. Gotcha. Okay. So makes sense. Then. I had seen quite a lot of that before. So I had a decent understanding of the material. Um, but, um, I don't know, Bob had actually, he gave us a, a handout of a whole bunch of different types of projects. He was also interested in late metal oxo compounds at that time and trying mm. to figure out what, you know, metal oxo compounds to make. And, you know, my lab mates were working on making metal amido compounds. Dave Blick and Pat Walsh made some classic metal amido compounds during that time I was there. Um, so, you know, he had pr- some broad interests. Um, I became interested in, in general, in CH activation, and I can't say that I know why. <laughs> you know, it's, it's quite a while ago now. Um, <laughs> maybe that, I think it might have had some of the roots from the organometallics class with Schwartz and Schwartz saying, you know, something about the discovery of that during that class. Mm. But, um, you know, I guess a story I t- told many times to people is that um, when I joined the lab, there were actually some people in the group that were saying, you know, that CH activation had been done, you know, that I, I joined um, six years after the first discovery, I guess, of that okay. addition. Reaction. And so they're like, you know, that's, you know, it's been done. So maybe you want to work on optimal compounds or something else. Yeah. So, but we were never very successful, I must say, in my own PhD work in on the CH activation side. I mean, we had mm. a, we had a, a mechanistic paper, but, um, you know, we didn't have any, alk- I never activated an alkyl CH bond or even right. maybe a barrel, barrel CH bond during the time I was there. That was so coming though. Like That's coming. Oxides and, and, and the mito compounds and things like that. So, okay. um, I wouldn't say that my initial F, you know, the, the initial direction of the project to, to look for CH activation of those compounds was particularly, um, successful. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you took things on, you took things in different directions. Yeah. So after, you know, after a few years in graduate school, you obviously graduated and then you went on to do a postdoc uh, with Professor uh, Stephen Leppard. Um, I, I, how was, you know, that experience and, you know, was, I guess, you know, like you mentioned, you, you come from academia, I guess at this point was becoming a professor something you'd really had considered, like at what point kind of did you really like really wanted to become yeah. your own a professor? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That was, I, I um, you know, was, was um, doing my postdoc on a topic that was one that, you know, I thought might lead, I might work on during my independent career. Mm. Um, and for someone Excellent. who had had many people who, you know, had followed an academic path. Um, so that was, that was the plan, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> I've never thought that I really planned out my career and all, you know, in a very strategic way. It's always just kind of seemed to turn out okay. Um, sure. But, no, but deciding to work for Steve Lippard was, you know, was partly because he had people who were um, following, you know, very successful academic careers. And mm-hmm. um, and because it was in a field of bioinorganic chemistry that was, you know, involved metals, but was different and was, uh, you know, a field that looked to be something that was really going to grow in the future. All right. Okay. Yeah. So I guess you then you're early on. So early on career, you know, you started at um, Yale, and then you moved to, uh, University of Illinois, uh, mm-hmm. Urbana-Champaign, which is where my advisor, Brad Carroll, was also one of your students, um, quite yeah. of interesting pathway here. And then, but now you're at, uh, UC Berkeley, I guess what I'm, what I'm also curious about is, so you had mentioned that you, in your graduate studies, you were looking at, you know, CH activation and, um, of organometallic complexes. And then early in your career, you done well ch activation of really alkyl and aryl ch bonds so how did that like research transpire like what was kind of the natural progression because eventually eventually you're able to do you know ch functionalization of alkyl groups basically with uh you know functionalizing primary alkyl ch bonds with like b pin reagents so i'm kind of curious to see how that progression came um and how that you know what led to that discovery yeah, um, it was another one of those uh, unplanned discoveries, really. I, I did write proposals um, 
I guess the original job proposals were on compounds with metal boron double bonds, now mm. boron mm. compounds. And the idea was that if those compounds would activate a CH bond, that um, they might, because of the electrophilicity of boron, as opposed to the more electron net, you know, um, more nucleophilicity of say alkyl or amido compounds that by that reversal of polarity, you might reverse the direction of the CH activation. So you'd make a boron carbon bond in the product. So I, I think I've never actually gone back to check, but my memory is, is that the, my very, very earliest proposals had that kind of a scheme in there for reactions at a metal boron double bond. Hmm. If you believe that those bonds exist actually. Um, so, because <laughs> you can also formulate them as a neutral L-type borylene instead of an, you know, X2-type ligand. Sure. Um, so, um, but it wasn't like we were making the compounds for that purpose. And mm. again, you know, we, you know, projects change and we made boral compounds, you know, metal boron single bonds instead. And we were actually trying to photolyze those compounds to homolyze the metal boron bond, like sometimes metal alkyl bonds homolyze when you photolyze them. Hmm. And, um, and we did that with some metal carbonyl compounds. So instead of the metal carbon, metal boron bond homolyzing, the more classical dissociation of carbon monoxide occurred. And just by chance, really, um, those compounds reacted with the solvent, the benzene solvent, and then hmm. led to the formation of the aryl boron ester with the boral group would get from the metal would get transferred to the uh to the arene to the ch bond position of the arene so it oh, was really true. uh that like um you know that chance observation although with our eyes open to ch activation because i had worked on it before but it wasn't like we were making those compounds because we thought that that right. would be the goal but once we observed that reaction of course then we tried to develop compounds that would react with alkyl ch bonds and once we had the compounds that would do that, we tried to develop a catalytic process, which we did. And then we tried to do something practical with it. And then, you know, one thing the natural the progression, it's go by and then people are starting to, you know, make, make products from yeah. you know, make feel up of pharmaceutical synthesis using the reaction and use it for discovery purposes and so forth. So that's really cool. Um, but it, the very, very origin of it was just simply looking at what the, you know, what would happen if you changed the polarity of the metal X bond, you know, from an alkyl group to a boral group and made it more electropositive, what would then happen? Mm -hmm. Maybe maybe we should take a step back just a, a quick second here and maybe explain to the viewers just the general, you know, what is CH functionalization? Maybe some people don't even know what that is. So maybe we should just start there for a moment. Um, and mm -hmm. why why it's hard to, I think my might be also a good discussion too is why in general like alkanes why is it hard to functionalize let's say primary groups like what what makes it difficult maybe we should just start probably should start with that honestly but you know you're here now <laughs> no, we'll circle around for that yeah yeah so the i mean the the functionalization of alkyl ch bonds it has a very very long history right? so the you know as the term would imply it's it's taking a molecule at a with a ch carbon hydrogen bond in it and placing a functional group at that position, right? So a collection of atoms that has greater reactivity and, you know, has uh, header atoms that allow for molecular recognition often. Mm. So, um, you know, the long, long-term goal of that and the very original goals were not really the way people are using it now, it was mostly to, um, you know, convert methane to methanol, mm. maybe, long chain alkanes like butane, you know, the alkanes you get from cracking and to put a functional group at the end so you could make butane, ethanol, but largely uh, the motivation was methane to methanol to take, you know, gaseous alkanes and make them liquid so you could then mm. transport them more easily. Um, Actually, so, I didn't know that. That's interesting. Yeah. I mean, uh, <laughs> um, I think I, I, I wrote a, a perspective article for Jax. I don't remember the exact title, but it was mm. something like uh, methane from methane to medicine or something like that. Mm, uh, I'll check that out. It's, it's interesting. So, um, so that was the long-term goal. And of course, the challenge is that the CH bonds are not acidic, so you can't deprotonate them. Um, there's no lone pairs for Lewis acid base adducts to form. Uh, the CH bond is nonpolar. So, and, uh, you know, so it's difficult to get reactivity when, you know, that would be polar based reactivity. 
there's no leaving groups like there are in, you know, alkyl halides or something like that. So um, without any of those properties of polarity, acidity, leaving groups, um, that's why alkanes are inert. Mm -hmm. yep. um, and then if you think of an alkane that's not methane, but something that has primary, secondary, and tertiary CH bonds, um, you know, radicals do react with alkanes and you can make, you know, methyl chloride and methylene chloride and chloroform from chlorine and, you know, radicals and alkanes. Um, but if you have a longer chain alkane, the radicals tend to react at the secondary CH bonds and the tertiary CH bonds. So one of the goals that, um, you know, many people in the field had was to try to redirect that selectivity so the reaction would occur at a primary CH bond or that's the stronger CH bond over the secondary and tertiary ones. And so what was known from the early days of Bob Bergman's work and particularly uh, Bill Jones's early examples of the oxidative addition of alkyl CH bonds of say pentane or hexane is that the reaction would occur selectively at the primary CH bond because the primary alkyl metal complex is more stable than the secondary alkyl, just like butyl lithium is a little more, you know, less basic than sec butyl lithium is less basic than true butyl lithium. Really? So, okay. yeah, so in a transition metal like would favor the primary alkyl. Okay. So then if you had some way to, you know, place a functional group at that carbon that's attached to the metal, then you would have this reaction that was selective to functionalize primary CH bonds. And it just happened, you know, not by design, but by chance for us, and you can understand in retrospect why it does so, that the boral group then would couple with the alkyl group. Mm. The boral group then it leads to the functionalization of alkyl CH bonds at the primary position. That's really cool. I, I, thank you for the insight on that, because I've definitely yeah. always been wondering, like, how... I'm always curious to how these kind of... A lot of stuff is serendipitous, so I'm, I'm always kind of curious to see, like, mm -hmm. how it, it all transpires. Um, now, you know... Again, we're going to, you know, transition metal catalysis is a huge part of your research lab. Um, you know, another area of, of research in your lab is, you know, um, is, you know, carbon nitrogen bond formation. And so <laughs> I'm also curious to, to hear about, you know, how that reaction kind of came about, right? So, you know, obviously carbon nitrogen bonds are highly desirable, particularly for medicinal compounds. But I mean, I guess in general, like they're just super um, mm -hmm. useful. So I'm kind of yeah. curious to see how that kind of the palladium catalyzed uh, CN coupling reaction kind of came about. Yeah, that was more by design, um, but it was not because we were really attempting to um, solve a major synthetic problem. Sure. Right? And it was more about fundamentals. And we were interested in, or I, I was and my students <laughs> shared that interest in, in finding react complexes that would reductively eliminate to make carbon heteroatom bonds because reductive elimination make carbon hydrogen bonds as well established. You see bond formation by reductive elimination was part of, you know, the Suzuki and other, you know, Heck and Nagishi and chemistry. So, um, uh, so I was, I was interested in whether complexes would undergo that elementary reaction of reductive elimination to make a CN bond. Um, and uh, so we had, you know, made a few compounds and then we, you know, decided to focus on the palladium complexes with aryl and amido groups because of this paper by Kosugi and Megita that had been published about 10 years earlier than we started to work on that um, by a with a catalytic uh, reaction of tin amides and aryl halides to make uh, aryl amines. Mm. And so if that catalytic reaction worked, then this step was, you know, I guess it was a chance that that would be a, an elementary step in that catalytic process. So we began to study it for that reason. Um, it wasn't at the time pr particularly practical chemistry because the tin amides were, you know, they're toxic. People didn't want to use tin reagents and still reactions that was getting phased out. Um, they're unstable thermally, they're unstable to water. So you can't chromatograph them, you can't distill them, <laughs> you know, they're, mm. you can't, and they're toxic. So. Um, so it became much more practical when Steve Buckwald's group and my group published on using amines in the presence of base. And then there's been, you know, many generations of ligands to turn that into a practical process. Excellent. So, uh, but the initial, you know, motivation for working on that was a really a fundamental organometallic one about, uh, you know, trying to find complexes that would undergo reductive elimination to make carbon nitrogen bonds. Yeah, maybe we can just uh, just a brief insight on that. You know, why? Let's say traditionally speaking, why making carbon nitrogen bonds was, was difficult. Like, what was kind of hampering that sort of reactivity? Yeah, yeah. I mean, again, there was a, you know some fundamental organometallic chemistry types of questions at that time, and um, there were very few complexes 
that had were of the late transition metals, so the you know ruthenium's and palladiums and platinums, the those metals that were part of say you know palladium catalyzed cross coupling chemistry, so there weren't palladium amido compounds and palladium alkoxyl compounds. Those were either completely unknown or very rare. Hmm. Um, and that was in part because if you have beta hydrogens, they would undergo beta hydrogen elimination. And also the palladium is a soft metal and they'd be harder ligands. And so, you know, people thought about there being a, a mismatch of hard and soft. So um, part of the, you know, the overall research problem was, you know, what's going to be the chemistry of the compounds with a more electronegative nitrogen or oxygen atom bound to the soft palladium? What are going to be the rates of beta hydrogen elimination and could reductive elimination occur? Yeah, mm -hmm. so that's um, where kind of the, the challenges and why, you know, why did it take so long for people to, to do cross coupling to make CN or CO bonds? And, and it doesn't, you know, it doesn't occur with triphenylphosphine as ligand that everybody used at the time. You have to have some more uh, sophisticated ligands um, and, you know, sort of overcome the bias that the reactions weren't going to work because those types of intermediates were going to be unstable. Mm -hmm. What what I'm what I'm uh, curious to know about too is you know a lot of these intermediates that at least go through um, palladium um, catalysis are kind of like these you know three coordinate aero palladium species um, you know typically with a phosphine ligand doesn't have to be but I'm kind of curious to see how you guys managed to isolate those in compounds initially and what kind of what was kind of going on you know behind the scenes to get those kinds of complexes that ultimately leading you to these are on cycle types of uh, um, complexes. Yeah. Um, I never really imagined that we'd be able to make and isolate those three coordinate compounds because, mm -hmm. you know, prior to that work that they were deduced by kinetic studies, right? So a negative, you'd have a four coordinate compound and there would be an inverse order in ligand indicating there's a pre equilibrium for dissociation of the ligand from the metal center. So it was all through, you know, indirect kinetic measurements, the kinds of experiments I liked to do and why, you know, I, I like mechanistic studies and wanted to work on transition. Yeah. Milk. But um, I'm remembering back, I had a, a postdoc who's now very successful in his own independent career in Japan, Makoto Yamashita, hmm. who um, told me he wanted to make the three coordinate intermediates. And okay. uh, you know, he was working on this other very mechanistic project um, which, uh, I really liked that project on like trans effect on reductive elimination and on symmetrical ligands and things like that. Um, but, uh, but, you know, he also wanted to just kind of make stuff and do a little bit less of low temperature NMR. Is so that all, that's all was, you know, Thursday or Friday, he told me he was, you know, Thursday, he's told me he was going to try to make these compounds. And I said that, uh, you know, okay, go ahead, but I don't think you'll be able to do it. And, <laughs> And on Friday, he said that he had made the compound. And on Monday, you know, uh, once the crystallographer was back, we had a, a, a X-ray structure of the wow. three compound. And that was a, actually that was very much like Makoto. He was, you know, he's incredible at synthetic chemist and incredibly energetic person. And like he, he, could, he I would never say that's that awesome. He couldn't do something. And so yeah. Um, yeah, so that was the first. And then James Tambouli made some uh, three coordinate alkoxo compounds with uh, partially fluorinated alkoxides to stable them, stabilize them. Also. That's really cool. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. I think, yeah, I think that's that as a, uh, you know, doing platinum catalyzed reactions now. I'm like, I wonder who like kind of first discovered these things. Like, how did, like, I don't know. It's, it's, it's pretty, it's really cool to me to think about. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, so, you know, other parts of uh, other research areas of interest kind of in, within your group. Um, I actually didn't really know this for a while, but um, our, I guess our artificial metal enzymes, I saw recently um, kind of a iridium to do, was a cyclopropanation, mm -hmm. I think, of valines, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I I don't know, how did how did getting into metal enzymes, was that kind of new or has this kind of been something you've been doing and for a while, I, I didn't really, don't really. We really started working on it seriously um, when I came to Berkeley. Okay. Anna was the first graduate student, and Pavel Didio was a postdoc who joined with her on the project. Um, and they really had our first major successes in that area. When I was at Illinois, I was, we, uh, I was collaborating with Huimin Zhao, and we um, 
who was one of Francis Arnold's students. And so when I went mm -hmm. to Illinois, I said, we men, we should work on, you know, directed evolution of artificial metalloenzymes to do, you know, um, natural transformations. And we got a bit, um, veered a little bit off course in, uh, but a successful one on, uh, tandem reactions where you'd have an organometallic compound and a transition and a, an enzyme working together, mm -hmm. um, where the metal, you know, would isomerize a double bond up and down was the original plan or E and Z isomerization. And then the, um, enzyme would do a transformation on that. And we did some dynamic, prop, uh, um, uh, transformations on alkenes with a metathesis catalyst together with the enzyme. So we, you and I published a few papers together on that. Um, and, uh, but then when I went to Illinois, we really started to work on the, in our own lab, the artificial metalloenzymes and evolving them. And so, um, yeah, we've, um, uh, developed, uh, you know, an iridium uh, enzymes that contain iridium in place of iron in the porphyrin that enhances activity towards cyclopropanation. And so you said mm -hmm. it's, um, more active for cyclopropanation of allenes than the natural systems, at least this stage. Um. And for you know unactivated alkenes as well, and oh, wow. by being able to do the reaction, the these transformations on unconjugated, you know, slight, somewhat hindered alkenes on terpenes, we've been able to um, combine that reactivity with the um, biosynthesis of the substrate. And so, in a collaboration with Jay Kiesling, we've been able to um, biosynthesize. The alkene, so biosynthesize a terpene containing an alkene. In our first example, that was a small terpene, limonene monoterpene. Mm -hmm. um, and then instead of having that get oxidized by a P450 after it gets formed, we use cyclopropanate it after it gets formed. And so we have this organism that does artificial biosynthesis. And more recently, we published on being able to actually um, biosynthesize the diazo ester um, that is the carbene precursor that everybody uses. In this case, it's a Azoserine, so it's a diazo compound that's based off an amino acid rather than just ethyl diazoacetate, but it's mm. still a diazo ester, and then that would um, um, undergo carbene transfer to styrene, which was a biosynthesized in the same organism. So we have this oh. entire biosynthetic pathway of an unnatural amino acid with a cyclopropane from carbene transfers. So that's been a, a you know also a really productive collaboration. Yeah. And, uh, on how you use you know laboratory chemistry within an organism to create artificial natural artificial products yeah products. yeah just on that i mean maybe a little bit of insight on because you know maybe a lot of people will know or maybe they don't know but you know a lot of heme proteins contain well all of them contain iron that's that's what the the metal mm -hmm. is and i'm curious, curious to see how changing that metal kind of helps with this reaction i don't know if you kind of mm -hmm. is there a general consensus on how changing that metal kind of helps these types of reactions or in particular, or I don't know, I don't know. That's kind of well, difficult. You know, to be honest, I don't really know why the iridium complexes um, mm -hmm. are so reactive for this group transfer, but we didn't invent that. Keith Wu um, okay. published a series of papers on, you know, tetraphenyl porphyrin iridium complexes for group transfers and that they were very, very reactive. So when Hannah and Pavel were doing the first studies with you know, artificial hemes or, you know, unnatural metal porphyrin complexes to see what they would do. They included this iridium methyl porphyrin in there because of Keith's work. Okay. So, um, and then it turned out that, you know, the, that, it's, that iridium three compound with a methyl group on it is very stable and reactive. So, um, you know, the, reactive at the open site, but the methyl group stays on and it's very, you know, it's air stable compound. And, um, more, you know, stable to water, unlike a lot of, think of a lot of organometallic compounds. Um, so that is, those properties are what made it suitable for this. Yeah. There are other, you know, there are other metal porphyrins, right? Peter Zhang's group has, has published on all sorts of, you know, metalloradical kind of based um, transformations of metal porphyrin complexes. Um, so, you know, there's a wide variety of reactivities of metal porphyrin complexes beyond the heme ones. It's just yeah. that they haven't been inside proteins very much. In that do depth. you get any? Uh, do you get any? Do you get any backlash from people who are like, "Why are you changing the, to iridium? It's like a really expensive metal when you have iron." Yeah, we do. We like, do. I can guarantee you that the cost of the students and everything else is a lot more expensive. <laughs> it's a lot 
Stadium has gone up because of it being used in displays, I think is the reason. Really? Okay. Yeah. Oh, man. Um, yeah, that's, that's I, uh, I, I heard from somewhere, I think it was Emily Pencer was telling me, like, look, like, look, like, if the chemistry works, it works. Like, you know what I mean? Like, it, you know, we all would love it if everything could be made with like iron or something like that, but it's just, it's just not how it works. Um, so yeah, <laughs> I, one, of the, one of the cool things about the way that, um, we use the artificial, um, metal porphyrin complex when we're doing whole cell, um, biocatalysis, we have a transporter that actively transports the artificial, you know, metal porphyrin yeah. complex into the cell. So mm -hmm. we put in like sub part per million levels of iridium into the growth, oh, wow. but it gets concentrated to micromolar, we estimate micromolar levels within the cell. So it's actually very little iridium that is yeah. wasted, right? That doesn't end up within the protein when we do that. So, Interesting. Uh, not the, again, not, not totally planned, but I mean, it was planned to use a transporter, but we didn't know exactly mm -hmm. how it worked. Yeah. So I, I guess a, a question on this then is, you know, I, I don't know. I don't really know what the long term goals are. Maybe a little insight to this, but like, obviously, like, I mean, could you, could people just get these enzymes, these enzymes and place in, I guess, if they had access to iridium, they could, and then do these kinds of reactions. Like, is that kind of, I don't know if that's, I know you're kind of more fundamental. Well, yeah, yeah I mean, okay. long term goal, whether it's iridium or some other cofactor that gets, yeah, yeah. I mean, um, that, and, and, you know, that is a question that, um, many people ask of, the, of those in the field of biocatalysis and I'm part of an NSF center that, mm -hmm. um, on chemoenzymatic synthesis is kind of the overall overarching, um, topic of that center. And part of it is to kind of bring biocatalysis to the synthetic community. Yeah. And maybe we've perhaps proven that, you know, synthetic chemists can do biocatalysis because it's not like we, you know, came into this with a lot of training. Um, but, um, you know, we yeah. came with our organometallic know-how and, you know, and, and, and some good students and, and postdoc with Hanan and Pavel to get us going on that. And then, we'll, you know, the knowledge gets passed down. Mm -hmm. personally. Yeah. I think, I mean, biocatalysis, I mean, in and of itself, it's just an interesting field, I think. And I mean, there's, gotta be millions of billions maybe of, of these proteins i mean i guess you know uh, how do you choose like i mean is there uh, like you mentioned i guess people were doing this prior work um but is there like a, a plethora of reactions that you guys want to try with these enzymes or how does it kind of how do you like decipher which ones to try um yeah that is a good question <laughs> <laughs> um and there's, you know, it's a growing field, right? And so some people have been looking at radical-based chemistry, right? Several mm. people are doing that um, because if you're doing chemistry in water, right, then um, if you're, you know, using something strongly basic, then you have a trouble, right? But if you're using a radical because the OH bond is so strong, the radical, you know, the medium tolerates radical reactions. And of course, that's, you know, nature also uses that right uh stability of water towards radicals when they're developing um, you know when it, when reactions are evolved um so you know some of it the field has been working toward radical based chemistry the group transfer reactions are um pretty tolerant of water um again and and not and involving reactants that are not basic or acidic mm. so um and then, you know, Tom Ward's group has done a lot of organometallic chemistry with a streptavidin biotin system where they tether biotin onto an organometallic complex and they do, a, a, you know, hydrogenation chemistry, imine and, and ketone, hydro, imine hydrogenation, I'm not sure how much ketone, but they've done some nice imine hydrogenation chemistry that's unnatural, um, a little bit of CH activation chemistry um, mm. that's tolerant of water. So, um, yeah, but you do have to, you do have some constraints by having to work relatively near neutral pH. Mm. So maybe, you know, if we could have those kinds of enzymes working in organic solvents, if the enzymes were more stable, um, maybe there would be a wider range of reactions that people could do. Mm. So that's okay. something we're interested in trying to address is that, um, that issue. Right. Well, I definitely look forward to how that gets extended, um, in, in, in the future. And one mm -hmm. last one last area of research I definitely want to touch on um, is, 
this the idea of kind of upcycling uh, polymers. So I guess by extension to your earlier work, I mean, if you can functionalize primary, um, you know, CH bonds, you could in theory do this on polymers really. And then this would be great, um, great application for it because at least for people of the general audience, you know, who see, uh, you know, polymer trash in our oceans and stuff like that. Um, but, you know, in all seriousness though, that, yeah, in principle that this could be used, um, this, there, this, um, platform could be used to do upcycling of polymers. And so maybe, um, tell us a little bit about how you kind of got into this, um, area of research, but also, you know, how this, how this works and why I've, you know, and why is it, you know, hard to upcycle mm-hmm. polymers, even, even recycle polymers in general, honestly. Yeah. So there's a number of questions you, you asked in there. Yeah. It's have... a deep one. <laughs> eh, unravel okay. it. So I'll take this, the simpler, more focused ones first. I mean, so how did we get into it? And mm. as you said, we um, were working on CHF bond functionalization. And, you know, when we first discovered the functionalization of primary CH bonds and alkanes, um, the question was whether one could uh, apply that to the CH bonds of polyolefins. And so Mark Hillmeyer actually made contact with me many years ago about um, about that question and whether we could then apply this rhodium catalyzed borylation chemistry to the functionalization of, of polyolefins. And so could you take polypropylene, we did this, right? Could you take polypropylene and functionalize the primary CH bonds of the methyl groups along that chain? Could you take, take say, ethylene octene copolymer? That's a well-known, very tough material. And now you have just a few methyl groups at those at the end of the hexyl side chains of that polymer. Um, could you functionalize those? So we had a few papers on that, um, maybe 20 years ago now. Mm. <laughs> you know, they, um, we, you know, Mark and I tried to sort of have a program on post polymerization functionalization at that time, but it was not something that was an area that there was, a, oh, I don't want to say, wouldn't say that there's not a lot of interest in, but there just wasn't a lot of focus on that at that time. Sure. So, um, it was really, I don't know, 15 years later or something like that, that there became much more of a focus on being able to do this. We actually had a collaboration with 3M on, on, on sort of functionalization of polyolefins again, different than polypropylene. Um, and, and then at that time, we were also became interested in whether we could functionalize secondary CH bonds of polyolefins mm. and, you know, directly oxidize as a, which would be more practical than doing a borylation oxidation sequence, obviously. So, um, and then this whole like tsunami of interest in, uh, in the upcycling of polyolefins came about and we were, you know, at that time we were already working on CH bond functionalization of and transformations of polyolefins to get new properties. So that led us to think a little bit more about whether we could use that CH activation as a trigger for cleavage of the materials or imparting properties that would be valuable from waste materials and how we could break them down. And so that's what's led to that. Um, but you also asked about like, why is it so hard? I mean, on the scientific level, it's the same question as you asked before about methane or little small alkanes. Like they're not, a, you know, a polyethylene is polyethylene is useful because it's so stable because the CH yeah. bonds are oxidized because the carbon carbon bonds don't cleave. Right. I mean, all the same arguments about why methane stable applies to polyethylene also. Um, but on top of that, well, I guess in, on top of those scientific issues is just the fact that the volume is so high and the cost is so low. Mm. Maybe that's the same as with methane, right? So there are, you know, systems that will, you know, functionalize methane, but to do it in a way that can be used on the scale at which methane gets generated and at a cost, like, you know, methanol is cheap, right? So at a cost that is commensurate with the cost of the products, is really, really challenging. And so the same is then true for polyolefins. Maybe the scale is smaller than methane, but it's still, you know, half a trillion pounds per year of polyolefins being made. And if, you know, crazy. So, and they're inexpensive. And so, you know, to, yeah, to, to do something that is really practical is going to be a challenge. So I guess we and others in the field hope that by, you know, in academics, generating concepts and showing what some of the potential is, you could direct 
toward things that would ultimately be practical in the end. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So I, I uh, yeah, your most recent paper is kind of using kind of a copper catalyst. I'm mm -hmm. kind of curious to how does that, cause I, I'm not really a polymer chemist. So I'm like, it, I'm just, I'm just trying to imagine like taking like waste polymers and like, what do you, uh, do you have to dissolve it in something? And then like, how does, is it homogenous or like heterogeneous? Like how does it, as a work. <laughs> yeah, there's a couple ways to do it. So the that original work we did with Hillmeyer on the borelation of polyolefins was actually done in the polymer melt. There was no solvent. Mm. And so we run those reactions at 200, I guess, around that uh, temperature at which the polymer would melt. It's still pretty viscous, but you could stir it some. Okay. Um, so it was a homogeneous reaction, but not with solvent. And at that time, all of the chemistry we did was you know, the substrate was the solvent. So if we ran a reaction with octane, we did it in octane. We didn't have right. solvent. Okay. So more recently, like that copper catalyzed amidation of polyolefins is in an inert salt, in, in, not inert solvent, but a solvent that doesn't undergo the reaction. Hmm. And uh, we did direct oxidation with nickel and ruthenium catalysts where we, again, would use, you know, methylene chloride or dichloroethane or dichlorobenzene as solvent that would dissolve the polyolefins. Um, we did one experiment in the polymer melt and it worked. It didn't give quite as high a degree of functionalization. Um, so we still need to work on that. And that's a little bit of a mechanical problem, to, again, because the material is so viscous, right? To get yeah. everything mixed is non-trivial, um, but it can be done in the melt. <laughs> yeah. But the challenge, you know, is it's a slightly different challenge from, um, from well, a very different challenge than CH functionalization for the synthesis of complex molecules because now you need the react you you need the reaction to occur at high temperature. You're not trying to do something under the mildest conditions because it has to, you know, be heated to dissolve or to melt. The plasma, so, yeah. Hmm. So, um, so you need a catalyst that operates at 150 to 200 degrees. And, you know, many of the kind of oxidation catalysts and other kinds of catalysts don't operate under those conditions. Yeah. So we had, um, Batron and my group had discovered this copper catalyzed amidation reaction a while ago. Um, the functional group compatibility was poor and the temperature was kind of high and it worked in aromatic solvents because it was a radical reaction. So it tolerate arians. So that was like the perfect recipe yeah. for polymer hmm. functionalization because high temperature, who cares about functional group compatibility if you're doing it on, on polyethylene. Right. And, uh, and then the arian solvent was one we switched to, uh, um, chlorobenzene and dichlorobenzene. Um, but that would dissolve the, uh, polymer then. So that, um, Nico Chicha and my group who did that work um, really recognized that that reaction was one that could be applied toward polyolefins. Yeah. Well, Professor Harvey, I want to thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. It was an extremely pleasure talking with you um, and extremely fun today. And hopefully, you know, I'm excited, you know, as always, you know, more research out of your lab. It's quite, quite, um, you know, obviously quite an active lab. And, you know, it's really, you know, really, really cool talking with you today. So thank you. Yeah, great to be with you. All right, everyone. Well, thank you for another episode, and uh, you know, we'll see you in the next one.